Hi, I'm here because we need to redefine what it means to be a badass. You see, the way we think about strong is wrong. I'm here because we need to start giving people permission to feel. More specifically, I'm here because we need to start giving men permission to feel. You see, I've given some variant of this talk all across North America, and without fail, men come up to me afterwards, and there's a universal truth. Everywhere I go, men are literally dying for somebody to give them permission to feel. Now, I know what you're asking yourself. Self, why do I care? Why does this matter? Why is this important? So let me tell you. For over two decades, I've studied the impact that emotion has on human behavior and the decisions we make. As a business leader and a sales professional, I studied the likes of Dr. Antonio Damasio, Dr. Travis Bradbury, Dan Goleman, Dr. Brene Brown, just to name a few. It became obvious early in my sales career that my customers bought on emotion justified by logic. And I worked hard to make that emotional connection with them. Later on as a business leader with staff, it became evident that staff productivity, their behavior and the decisions they made were directly linked to emotion. I wanna share with you a story in August of 2015, my girlfriend Colleen and I took a road trip to Penticton where I was going to compete in the Challenge Penticton, an iron distance triathlon. Now, Colleen likes to tease me about how badass I am. As a rock climber, an ice climber, a yogi, a business leader, an Ironman, an ultramarathon, she teases me often. And I gotta tell you, as a guy that's always been more geek than jock, as a guy that's always been more nerd than cool kid, secretly, my heart swells with pride when she does that. This weekend, though, I was about to get a lesson in what it really meant to be a badass. This weekend, my mom came out from the West Coast to cheer me on. My Aunt Sharon was there. Now, let me tell you about my Aunt Sharon. My Aunt Sharon is a badass. Aunt Sharon is 65 years old. She's not overly fit, not overly active, a feisty woman. We ended up for dinner at her place that night. And Sharon starts telling us this story over dinner. She says, you know, I decided earlier this year that I wanted to get a little bit more active. I wanted to become a little bit more fit. So as a result, I decided I was gonna sign up for the 5K fun run leading up to Challenge Penticton. She says, you know, I knew full well I was gonna be dead last. And I kinda of went, huh, I mean, how many of you would have the courage to compete in a race that you knew full well you were gonna finish dead last? Probably not a lot of us. So Sharon went on with this story. She says, so it came to race day, we lined up at the start line. I went way to the back of the pack behind everybody else. The gun went, everybody took off, and there I was, way at the back. She says, I got to about a kilometer away from the finish line, and she says, all of a sudden this kid on a bike starts riding beside me. She says, so I looked over at him, and I said, you're here because I'm last, aren't you? He says, yep, I'm afraid so. But you're doing great, you're doing great! And he starts riding beside her, and he rides the rest of the way in with her. Now, they get within a couple hundred meters of the finish line, and he says to her, you know what? You're doing great. I'm going to ride ahead and let him know you're still out on course. So she says, no, 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 no. And he says, yeah, yeah, and he takes off. She looks up, and she can see they've already started tearing down the finish line. They've already started packing up the PA system. Like, she is that far last. He gets there, lets him know she's still out on course. They reset up the finish line. They start unpacking the PA system. Well, not only do they set everything back up again, 
but they send Jeff Simons out to run across with her. And if you don't know who Jeff Simons is, Jeff Simons is a professional triathlete. I think he won the 2017 Melbourne Ironman. He's a local boy and a real badass when it comes to triathlon. There's Sharon finishing her run. So she finishes the story, she gets up, clears the table and goes into the kitchen. Colleen looks at me and just says, you know what, Mike? She goes, now that's freaking badass. And the entire 10 and a half hour drive home the next day, Colleen and I talked about what does it really mean to be a badass? We happened to have the Tim Ferriss podcast playing and Tim was interviewing one of my favorite researchers, a lady by the name of Brene Brown. And somewhere in the conversation, Tim asked her something to the effect of, what do you think of the over-feminization of boys in our school system? And I kind of went, huh, caught my attention, but Brene handled it brilliantly. She said, well, first off, I don't believe that masculine and feminine are mutually exclusive. She said, secondly, and this, this brought it all home for me. She said, secondly, I believe that that perfect combination of tough and tender is the exact equation for badassery. Boom. There it was. A real badass is not afraid to be vulnerable like my Aunt Sharon. If you followed any of Brene's work, you know she talks about vulnerability being the core of all emotion. A real badass is not afraid to feel. A little over a month later, this concept would have a profound impact on me. In fact, it would change my life. On October 2nd of 2015, Colleen woke up at my place at five o'clock in the morning, like she often did. She taught yoga at six. She got up, she got dressed, she came around to my side of the bed, gave me a kiss, I said, have fun at yoga, and off she went. I rolled over and went back to sleep, because that's what you do at five o'clock in the morning, you sleep. <laughs> I woke up around 6.30, quarter to seven, went downstairs, got myself some breakfast, and as was our custom, about 10 after seven, I shot her a text. I said, good morning. No response. Not a big deal. Colleen's not a huge talker, but she's an incredible listener. And as a result, she often got drawn into conversations with her students after class. I carried on my morning, kept going. 8.15, still no response. I shot her another text, good morning. I had a nine o'clock appointment downtown. Still no response. I hopped in the car, I drove downtown. The phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and eventually went to voicemail. Went into my nine o'clock, finished my nine o'clock, got out about 10, looked at my phone, no text, no phone call. Now I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. This is a little bit out of character. I had an 11 o'clock appointment back at the office. I hopped in the car, I started driving back to the office, I tried calling her again. The phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and eventually went to voicemail. Still no response. So now I'm starting to get, you know, that, that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when you just feel like so, something's not quite right. I got back to the office, I got ready for my 11 o'clock, and as I was walking into the boardroom just before 11, I shot her a text, I said, hey, let me know you're okay, I'm starting to get a little bit worried about you. I'm heading into my 11 o'clock. Had my 11 o'clock appointment, we finished around quarter to 12, we had a great meeting, we decided we'd go across the street to Vicky's for lunch to celebrate. We walked across the street, and as the hostess was about to seat us, my phone rang. I looked at it, it was a blocked number. I answered the phone, a voice on the other end says, is this Mike Cameron? I said, yes. He says, this is Constable so-and-so. I don't remember his name, my heart just sank. I said, is she okay? He says, where are you? I said, is she okay? He says, where are you? We're at your house, we're coming to you. So I told him where I was, I turned and I walked out of the restaurant, I don't even think I said two words to my guests. I walked outside, I walked to the street, I stood at the curb and I waited. About five minutes later, an unmarked police car drove up across the street. 
I started walking across the street to meet him. Big, burly, badass-looking cop gets out of the car, gun on his hip, badge around his neck. He meets me halfway across the road, and after identifying who I was, he said three words to me that would change my life forever. He looked me in the eye, and he said, Colleen is dead. Shot and killed by an ex-boyfriend who subsequently took his own life. We make decisions based on emotion. The research backs this up. Paul Joseph Jacob, the man that killed Colleen, was a man that made a decision based on emotion. He made a decision with very permanent consequences based on a very temporary emotion. As men, from the time we're in diapers, we're taught to be strong. And when Colleen was killed, I had many well-meaning friends surround me, hug me, pat me on the back, and tell me to be strong. But the truth of the matter was, I didn't want to be strong. I wanted to curl up into a little ball and I wanted to cry like a little baby. And while I love them for their intention, I'm saddened by their ignorance. You see, true strength isn't about avoiding, suppressing, or remaining stoic in the face of our emotions. True strength is about having the courage to face our emotions head on, sit with them, observe them, and learn from them what we can. Colleen and I used to talk a lot of philosophy. One of my favorite conversations, we talked about talent. And I asked her, I said, what's your talent? And she replied immediately, well, I make things beautiful, which she absolutely did. As an artist, a photographer, a videographer, a painter, a potter, she absolutely had a knack for finding the beauty in everything and making things beautiful. Then she turned it around and she asked me, she says, well, what do you think your talent is? And I kind of hummed and hawed and I said, you know, not to take away because by all standard measures I've been successful, but I'm not sure that I've got a particular talent. I'm not sure that there's any one thing that I'm particularly gifted at. I said, what do you think my talent is? She said, oh, that's easy. You've got a much more useful talent. I said, oh, what's that? She said, you make shit happen. I went, huh, as a business guy, I kind of like that. So there you had it. She made things beautiful, I made shit happen. Together, we were gonna make beautiful shit happen. <laughs> I vowed on October 2nd that her story would not end there on her driveway. I vowed that I would continue to do my best to make beautiful shit happen in her name. So my ask of you today is to help me redefine what it means to be a badass. My ask of you today is to give men permission to feel. I need you to feel more, feel more often. I need you to find your feelings, be badass, and make beautiful shit happen. Thank you.